A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, O people of Zion, who dwell in Jerusalem, no more will you weep. He will be gracious to you when you cry out. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. The Lord will give you the bread you need and the water for which you thirst. No longer will your teacher hide himself, but with your own eyes you shall see your teacher, while from behind a voice shall sound in your ears. This is the way, walk in it, when you would return to the right or to the left. He will give rain for the seed that you sow in the ground, and the wheat that the soil produces will be rich and abundant. On that day, your flock will be given pasture, and the lamb will graze in spacious meadows. The oxen and the asses that till the ground will eat silage tossed to them with shovel and pitchfork. Upon every high mountain and lofty hill, there will be streams of running water. On the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall, The light of the moon will be like that of the sun, and the light of the sun will be seven times greater, like the light of seven days. On the day of the Lord binds up the wounds of his people, he will heal the bruises left by his blows. Verbum Domini Blessed are all who wait for the Lord. Blessed are all who wait for the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he is good. Sing praise to our God, for he is gracious. It is fitting to praise him. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. The dispersed of Israel he gathers. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He tells the number of the stars. He calls each by name. Bless us, o great, Lord. great is our Lord and mighty in power. To his wisdom there is no limit. The Lord sustains the lowly, the wicked he casts to the ground. Bless us, o Sancti Vangeli secundo Matteo. Gloria a ti, Jesus went around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and curing every disease and illness. At the sight of the crowds, his heart was moved with pity for them because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Then he summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. 
Jesus sent out these 12 after instructing them thus, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. Verbum Domini. We have been hearing in this first week of Advent references to the marks of our Messiah the one for whom mankind longed from the fall of Adam. And the description of the Messiah was going to be one who would restore sight, who would give the lame the ability to walk, would restore hearing to the deaf, could raise the dead. And so in Jesus performing these miracles, uh, the people uh, were to see in him and come to faith in him, recognizing that he is truly the one sent by God, the Messiah. And in this passage today from St. Matthew, we see that Jesus shared these gifts um, with his disciples as he sent them out. He shared his gifts with his church. And so the church carries on this mission of Christ in the world, doing exactly what he commanded his disciples to do, proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is at hand because the Messiah has come. And so he said to them, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Now all these things that Christ did with authority, he shared with his church, the ministers of his church. And isn't this what happens in each of our lives that we experience the power of the Messiah. We experience the power of the coming of God into our midst. And we have this living or this encounter with the living God who gives sight to our blindness, that we no longer walk in the dark, but that we live in the light and that we are invited to come to see God, that we come to know him, through faith, and that we will see him in all of his eternal glory. Many of us are bent over because of sin, and we are healed by God's mercy in the sacrament of confession. We're strengthened in his gift of the Holy Eucharist. You know that we are no longer bent over and lame, but we're able to stand upright and are able to walk and we're able to walk toward God. He opens our ears that we can hear him, and he loosens our tongues that we can praise him. This is the, the work of the church. Notice what he says in his command to the disciples. Without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. Remember Father James McKenna was an elderly priest here uh, for many of us who are now older in our community, but Father McKenna was our confessor for many years, and he lived here at EWTN, and um, some of our non-Catholic employees, they loved him tremendously, but they didn't always understand uh, the different things Father would do as a priest. Someone would come by for confession, or someone would stop and ask for anointing of the sick. And so they asked him one day, they trusted him enough, they said, Father, could you please explain to us, like, like how much is it that you get paid for a confession? (laughs) Or how much do they, how much is it worth to have the anointing of the sick? And he burst out laughing, and he said, you don't pay for that. You know, and what he was, he was really shocked. You know, people will often leave a stipend out of the goodness of their own heart. But this is the command of Christ. Without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. 
And so the church, through her ministers, dispenses as this instrument uh, for the dispensation of God's grace and mercy. And it is to be done freely because we've received this gift from God freely. And the free gift that we've received really is the gift of Jesus Christ. And in him we have life. In him we have a participation in grace, which is the life of God. So that's what I'd like to speak about this morning is what is the real gift we receive in Christmas but God himself? And we receive this little package called the Christ child who makes all the difference in the world. Today the church is observing this feast day of St. Nicholas and most of us uh, know him or honor him under the name of Santa Claus. But St. Nicholas was a real person and a bishop in the church in the fourth century. This is why we see Santa Claus usually dressed in red. He was wearing bishop, uh, bishop's garments. And St. Nicholas was born to very holy parents and we're told that uh, he was, from little on, he was raised in the faith. That already at five years old, he was studying his catechism and that he lived a life of penance. They tell us that uh, according to tradition, he would eat only one meal on Wednesdays and Fridays. You know, always uh, uh, disciplining himself. And really, um, we're also told that as a result of living in strengthening his faith and living a life of penance and prayer, that he was able to persevere in a life of purity. And so I would just challenge parents, you know, you want to raise a child like St. Nicholas because you're sharing of the gift of faith or this knowledge of God with your children and then help them learn how it is to live in the Christian way of life, both through little acts of personal discipline but also a life of charity, that we don't live, that we're not selfish, but that we're selfless, that we think of another and give to another. And this is how we know St. Nicholas. His parents died when he was a young man, and they were well-to-do, and so they left him as this young man who was very wealthy. Now, what's the temptation? Imagine yourself in your early 20s, your parents pass and you've got tons of money. You might make some big mistakes with that money. But St. Nicholas committed himself to use that wealth for charity. And so he was attentive to those who were in need. Um, one of the accounts that we're familiar with about his life is that he had heard of this man in his town who had three daughters. And this gentleman's wife had passed away. Things didn't go well with his business, and he was very, very poor. And if in those days there needed to be a dowry given with uh, a young woman to be married. So imagine that. You had to pay a guy to marry your daughter, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, this... Uh, that's just a joke for anyone with uh, <laughs> feminist tendencies. Um, but this gentleman couldn't afford to pay a dowry for any one of his three daughters, and they were going hungry. And so he came, he was on the verge of selling his daughters into a life of prostitution. Well, St. Nicholas, as a young man, heard this, and so he took a little, <clears throat> as the oldest daughter came of age to be married, he took a package and put gold coins in it, uh, that would be the amount of a dowry for her. And late at night, <clears throat> he went to this gentleman's home and he tossed it in the window. So this package of coins fell into the house and opened up on the floor. And it ha he did this again when the second daughter came of age and when the third daughter came of age. And the, the third time, the father knew that this would happen. And so he was very attentive to try to see who it was, who was this mystery man giving them this great gift and blessing. 
and he caught Nicholas outside of his home and profusely thanked him for saving his daughters from a horrible life and really giving them and preserving their dignity. This is what St. Nicholas did with his wealth in performing acts of charity. We're told that when he was a bishop, he was really from uh, the area of the world now known as Turkey. Uh, but when he became a bishop, he was very well loved because he had this attentiveness to the poor. And he had a special care for the little ones. So he is considered today a patron of little children. He's also a patron of sailors because there were a group of sailors who were their boat was caught in a storm and they were about ready to capsize. And they called out uh, his name, just asking for his help. And things settled and the, they were able to make it to the shore safely. So uh, St. Nicholas is uh, a patron for Russia, for sailors, and for little children. And he's loved throughout the world because of his gift giving. <laughs> We all know St. Nicholas and little traditions that we've grown up with in relation to him. What I would say as far as looking at saints uh, according to the, church, the church's teaching and how we honor them and how we admire them is in this way, that every saint in one way or another mirrors for us a particular facet of God. So maybe one saint is known especially for their life of charity or for their care of the poor or for their life of poverty. So they mirror for us Christ and our eternal Father. But St. Nicholas, if we look at his life, we could say that he offers for us a reflection of the attribute of the generosity of God. God who is the giver of all good gifts. And so we get just a little glimpse of this aspect of God by looking at the life and witness of St. Nicholas. And if we look at and, and study the generosity of God, his goodness to us, uh, in light of St. Nicholas, this is what we would say about God, that he knows exactly what we need. Now, isn't this what we say about Santa Claus and the gifts that we receive at Christmas? How does he know that that's what I need? Because it's a mirror for us of God who knows exactly to a T what it is that we need. The gifts that we receive from God far surpass any deserving on our part. Which one of us in all honesty or in all sincerity can walk before the Lord and say, okay, this is what I've done, A, B, and C, and this is what I deserve back. We tend to do that, and yet we catch ourselves as we move into prayer and say, well, Lord, <laughs> who am I to be asking for anything? You know, I don't deserve a darn thing in, if I'm really honest with myself and with the Lord. Everything is done by God for our benefit. Some of the saints point out, all we have to bring to God is our sins. Everything else is a gift from him. And the gifts that we receive from the Lord come when they are least expected, or when it's least expected. You know, it's oftentimes in the middle of the night. Like these gifts of St. Nicholas for those three daughters came at a time right when that man needed that the most, and at a time in the day when it was unexpected. At nighttime, all of a sudden, here comes this bag of gold coins uh, through, the, through the window. The greatest gift that we receive from the Lord is this gift of his Son, this manifestation of God's love for us. And when did grace enter into the world? When did light come into the darkness? but in the middle of the night. When we're all drowsy, when we're falling asleep, boom, here comes Christ, the Christ child. And all of the heavens open 
and the angels are singing and tapping the shepherds on the shoulder saying, arouse from your drowsiness and go look at this great gift that the world has received from the hand of God. And when we receive these gifts that are given to us from someone who seems to know us, gifts that from someone who knows exactly what we need, gifts that surpass any deserving on our part or expectation on our part, given at a time when we needed them most. What happens to us but we are like little children who look in awe and wonder and surprise. And this is what St. Nicholas helps to engender for us, that we have childlike hearts in this season of Advent as we look to Christmas and prepare our hearts for Christmas, that we look to God with a sense of awe and wonder and mystery, this greatest of all givers of gifts. You know, this is a God who knows us intimately and knows exactly what we need. As a little child in my own home from a German tradition. I know I often share, I wish I were Italian and had some uh, that, that Italian passion, but I grew up strictly German. And one of the things that would happen in our home on the feast of St. Nicholas, from a little child on up, there was a little paper package, a paper bag filled with candies and nuts that would be thrown into our home at a moment unexpected. I remember as a little child, all of, you hear this crash, the door would barely open and whoosh, in comes this little package. A little kid, you don't understand what that's about, but then when you hear the story of St. Nicholas, it, you say, St. Nicholas is visiting us. Now, as an adult, I wish that it would have been filled with real costly gold coins. <laughs> But as a little child, that package was filled with something of tremendous value. You know, little candies and sweets. My parents ate the nuts. But um, <laughs> I remember in those moments, that's when our parents would sit on the floor with us. They never sat on the floor with us, but they would help pick up all of these little candies. You know, that package would burst open. And what a surprise and a sense of wonder and mystery. Where did this come from? And the goodness that we receive from the hand of God. You know, eyes of children wide open. This is how we are to be as we look for, forward to Christmas. This gift of God that suddenly bursts into the world and captures your attention. It thrills your heart. Little children throughout different traditions were taught to set out their shoes the night before the Feast of St. Nicholas. Uh, I know the friars have done that at times, that they would set their shoes outside of their cells. Most often they would be left empty. Thank God they didn't <laughs> receive a, a, a lump of coal in their shoe. Um, but. Or we have the tradition, uh, because of setting out our shoes, just they're open, ready for whatever the Lord wants to give. Also the practice of hanging the stocking out, that the Lord would put something in, or that St. Nicholas would put something in as a gift from God. Um, so when we see our Christmas cards, or when we're decorating and hanging these Christmas stockings out uh, along the fireplace, that's what this comes from, you know, this eagerness to receive a gift from St. Nicholas. What we want to learn from that is that we need to open our hearts. We don't need to set out our shoes. We don't need to set out our stockings, although that's fun. But we want to set out our hearts, hearts that are open and hearts that are waiting, that the Lord will fill them with whatever gift he knows that we need and that he wishes to fill us with this light and fill us with this grace and fill us with this life that comes from the gift of his son, Jesus.